It's 34 degrees. The truth and nothing but the truth. This is GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Amen, we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson, and with me today, B.J. Clark. B.J., so good to be with you. Good to be with you. B.J., today we want to discuss the second coming of Christ. The Bible talks a lot about His second coming, and there are some that seem to think they know when Jesus is going to come. Mm -hmm. How do you counter these claims that Jesus is coming soon, or He's going to come on this day or that day? How do you deal with that biblically? Well, the first thing we've got to do, and this may seem unusual to some people in the religious world, because they're used to hearing uh, folks on television say, the Lord spoke to me, and He told me thus and so, and such and such, and uh, the, God hasn't spoken directly to you or to me as if to reveal something that he hasn't told the whole world in this book right here. So the way we counter any doctrine about any subject biblically, of course, is to go to the actual source. And think about it. What could you and I know about the second coming of Christ if we take the Bible off the face of the earth? Wouldn't know anything. Uh, we could know there's a creator by still looking at the creation and seeing that someone had to make that tree and those mountains and the beautiful sunset. But what would that tell us about how it's all going to end? The only way that you or I or any of our viewers could know anything about what's going to happen at the end is if the one who started it at the beginning gives us insight and says, here's what I'm going to do. And he told us, if he told us anything at all, Jesus said this in Matthew 24. He said, you need to watch because you don't know what hour your Lord's coming. He said, if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief was coming, he would have watched, and he would not have suffered or allowed his house to be broken into. The point is, the thief doesn't call us up and give us advance warning and say, hey, tomorrow night I'm planning to rob your house. Just wanted to give you a little heads up. <laughs> well, if the, if the second coming of Christ is called like a thief in the night, and it's called that in Matthew 24, it's called that in 1 Thessalonians 5, it's called that in 2 Peter chapter 3, it's called that Revelation 16. You keep going how many times the Lord says he's coming as a thief. And yet we've got some folks who act like they know exactly when he's coming. No. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. Did, didn't Jesus say, of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. That ought to tell us something. Exactly. I mean, you said a moment ago, over and over again, the Bible talks about Jesus coming as a thief in the night. How in the world can people claim to know something that Jesus said is impossible to know. Exactly right. And these folks are, are quite frankly very inconsistent. I have a preacher friend who was driving down the road listening to AM radio station and the preacher that was doing the program there said that he had done the mathematical calculations, he'd looked in all the prophecies of the scriptures, he knew without a doubt, without a doubt, that the Lord was coming back in three weeks, the world would end in three weeks, it's all going to end, the Bible tells me so, he said. He went on like this for 28 minutes, and then his announcer came on at the end of the program and said, if you'd like a copy of this program, please write to us at this address and please allow four to six weeks <laughs> for delivery. If the world's ending in three weeks, I don't think there's going to be any postman or any earth to deliver mail on. What's, it, what's he doing here? A, a, a complete contradiction of what he just preached. B.J., in what you've said thus far makes me think about the all-sufficiency of the Scriptures. And maybe for just a minute or two, we ought to camp out on this idea of God's Word being inspired mm -hmm. and that God has given us everything we need to know about life and godliness. And so when we have questions that arise yeah. that are spiritual in nature, and this, of course, is a question that is rooted in Scripture, we need to go to the source. 
and that's the Word of God. And maybe that's been minimized in, in the religious world today. A lot of folks haven't taken the time to open the book and to do the research. And so how do we counter this, this wave of biblical illiteracy that's so prevalent? Isaiah 8 and verse 20 says to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this, it's because there's no light in them. God's Word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. And the way to expel or dispel darkness is to focus on the light. And the light of God's Word is very illuminating. Mm -hmm. I don't need some illumination from the Holy Spirit for me personally because holy men of God right. spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. So they wrote it down for me, wrote it down for you, for our viewers. And so let me ask you a question. If God wrote down that we cannot know the day or the hour wherein the Lord is coming, how can any man come along and say, oh, yes, you can? And if any man does come along and say, oh, yes, you can, my antenna ought to go up immediately. And I said, wait a minute. If God told men that he directly inspired mm. that you cannot know, and you come along as an uninspired man claiming that you do know, then Deuteronomy 18 That's right. uh, comes to mind because you remember that prophecy or that statement in Deuteronomy 18, 20 to 22 says, look, if a man comes along telling you he's a prophet and he predicts something's going to happen and then it does not happen, you know that man's not from God, no matter what he claims. You're right. And so what did men write down in Holy Scripture? That's what we use to determine what's going to happen at the end, not anything else. And I tell you, there's something comforting about that, Mike, because I don't have to worry about the speculations of men. I can read the exact revelation that God gave. That's right. I remember hearing Tom Holland say some years ago, the emphasis ought not to be on when Christ shall come, but it ought to be on the Christ who will come. Yes. And really, just readying ourselves for that day. BJ, I know when we talk about the second coming of Christ, there are some that have this idea that the Lord is going to somehow come and secretly rapture away the faithful. Mm -hmm. So how does all that harmonize with Scripture, and how do you counter that right. idea? Because, it's again, it's widespread. Oh, it's everywhere. <laughs> the Left Behind novels, the very point of Left Behind, according to them, is this. The righteous are supposedly going to vanish from the planet at this rapture moment, leaving the rest of the world in confusion. Where did Aunt Sue go? Where did Uncle Joe go? I don't know. I don't know where all these millions of people went. So then they're supposedly going to go to their Bibles to try to find some comfort or explanation. And that's when they're going to discover, oh, now I see. Okay, well, what passage would they turn to in this book that would explain such? Well, I show you a passage that shows there's no secret rapture. First Thessalonians chapter 4, see if this sounds remotely secretive. Paul said, verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That's verbal. With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Does that sound like something secret? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Don't you think you and I would notice dead people rising from the dead? And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And the premillennial doctrine says, and we'll go up to heaven for seven years. And then at the end of that seven years, while there's great tribulation going on upon the earth, at the end of that seven years of great tribulation, Jesus will bring us back. We'll fight the bloody battle of Armageddon will win the victory and Jesus will set up shop in Jerusalem for a literal 1,000 years of reign on the earth after which we'll finally go to either eternal heaven or eternal hell. That's the way the doctrine goes. But there's a problem. The Bible doesn't teach, so shall we be with the Lord for seven years and then come back. Once we've been snatched up, caught up in the Lord, in the air that is to meet the Lord, so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's never going to be any difference. So, so B.J., in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Bible speaks of Jesus coming, and there is a verbal announcement of that. 
In Revelation chapter 1, in verse 7, John said, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. That's visual. That's visible. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so you know, it's amazing yes. the things that people believe that are not rooted in Scripture. So, how do we counter this culture that has bought into something that, quite frankly, biblically, has no substance to it? Basically, we have to get them to go by this information instead of the movie information they've seen, or the books and the left behind novels they've read, or the doctrines and commandments of men and the catechism, the manuals and creeds of men. Mm -hmm. Until we can get people to go by what this book says, sure. then we're going to be in trouble. And you know, we're not the first generation to ever struggle with uh, misunderstandings about the end times. The very books of First and Second Thessalonians were written by Paul to address the misunderstanding the Thessalonians had right. about the coming of the Lord, which it, it becomes apparent. They were convinced that it was already started and commencing or that it was so close to commencing, they quit their jobs. They were just going to sit back and wait. And Paul says, if a man won't work, neither should he eat, Second Thessalonians 3, uh, 10 and following. And so he was basically trying to get them to realize, hey, wait a minute, I told you when I was with you, a couple of things have to happen before the final coming of the Lord can happen. Mm -hmm. There has to be the falling away, and there has to be the revelation of the man of sin. Those two things haven't happened yet. And so until they do, the second coming can't happen until this first thing happens. Now, frankly, those things have already happened. The falling away mm -hmm. was taking place in the form of Judaizing teachers mm -hmm. who were leading people away from Christianity back to the law of Moses. And the man of sin, in my judgment, best fits in that culture, in that context, a Jewish high priest who was sitting in a temple mm -hmm. in Jerusalem where he had no right to sit because our great high priest had passed into the heavens and so what would expose the man in the Jewish temple as a fraud, as an imposter? The destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 certainly accomplished that That's because right. once that happened, there was no place for him to show up for work. That's right. And it, they can't even uh, practice Judaism today. Well, that's right. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go back to AD 70 and you think about the destruction of, of, of the temple in Jerusalem itself, all of those records by way of genealogies, destroyed. There's no one that can even trace his lineage back. So we talk about the tribe of Levi, and they're functioning as priest in, in that scheme under that Mosaic dispensation. Not possible today. Right. B BJ, you mentioned, boy, you got so much out here for us to think about. Let's go back to Matthew 24 for a minute because I know that there are some people saying, now wait a minute, I know in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talked about some signs. And I hear people on, on television and, and on the radio talking about the signs of His coming and the signs are ripe. We know that His coming is near based on these signs. Is that what He's talking about? And if not, how do you counter it? Right. You know, in Matthew 24, context matters. Well, not just in Matthew 24. Any Bible study focuses on context, context, context. In verse 1 of Matthew 24, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. But really, we need to start even before that. Because Matthew didn't say, okay, I'm going to call this chapter 23, and I'll make this verse 1, this verse 2, this verse 3. The chapterization, the versification, of this was done much later for our, uh, you know, convenience, and That's it right. is convenient. But in the last part of Matthew 23, Jesus is telling them that because they had uh, killed the prophets and the persecution had come upon the righteous, uh, verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets, you stoned them which are sent to you. I wanted, he said, to gather your children together like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You would not. And then this statement, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. desolate. And then the next thing you read in chapter 24, 1, Jesus went out. Went out from where? Departed from the temple. That's what they considered the house of God. Now his disciples are anxious to show him the buildings of the temple. Why? He had just said it was all going to be left in desolation. They were like, do you not see how magnificent this is? And Jesus says, do you not see all these things? Verse 2, 
I'm telling you, there won't be left here one stone upon another that won't be thrown down. He's talking about the Jewish temple. Mm -hmm. Now, the disciples, Mike, what do they think about when that must be? They think that would be so catastrophic. Yeah. That would have to be equivalent to the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And so they come to him on the Mount of Olives privately, and they want to know, verse 3, <clears throat> tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming to the end of the world? And Jesus knew that people would be deceptive about this, so he said, don't let any man deceive you. And then what he does is beautiful. He starts giving them signs they could look at to know <clears throat> in their day and time that the destruction of the Jewish temple was coming closer and closer and closer. But then he does something in verse 36 that shows, wait a minute, your assumption that the day the Jewish temple is destroyed is the same day of judgment, the final day of judgment, is erroneous because whereas you have signs showing you when the destruction of Jerusalem will take place, of that day and hour, the final judgment, no man knows, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Right. It'll be like in Noah's day. They knew a flood was coming, but they didn't know exactly when That's until right. it arrived. And so there's the, the message, the essence of it all. These signs that are mentioned here. And, uh, and B.J., if you look at this contextually, in verse 2, it's evident he's talking about the destruction of the temple because he says not one stone should be left upon another. Mm -hmm. He said, that shall not be thrown down. So he's talking about that physical temple. Now I know that there are those, for example, in the religious world that will cite verse six. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. He said, see that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be, he said, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And they want to take these verses, lift them out of their context, and make them applicable to the second coming of Christ. That's not what he's talking about, no, is it? No, in fact, context keeps it in the first century. And you know, I wish that I had the, the time to just go back and read from historians like Tacitus, who was a Roman historian who talks about all the earthquakes that were taking place in the AD 60s, right before Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. And you can read Josephus, the Jewish historian, and read how all these famines they are documenting. There were people look at anytime there's a famine today, they think, oh, that's, that must be the sign. That's right. What they don't realize is. The famines that were the sign of what's being discussed here are famines that have already come and gone. That's right. And the destruction of the temple that Jesus was talking about has already come and gone. But the final day of judgment has not already come and gone. There are some false teachers who teach that the destruction of Jerusalem is the end of time. It was the second coming. They act like it was the end all and be all of biblical prophecy. It was an important biblical prophecy, right. but not the final one. That's right. There's another day coming in That's which right. the Lord's coming back, and of that day and hour, no signs. That's right. That's right. So, BJ, when we look at Matthew chapter 24, the signs referenced here destruction of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. destruction of the temple. Now, there are some that are saying and have said in days gone by, when the Lord comes, He's going to, as you alluded to a moment ago, set up shop in Jerusalem, and He will reign over His kingdom. Well, how do you counter that? Because if Jesus is a king, and He is, mm -hmm. He has to have a kingdom. I, I thought the Bible, I, I thought the Bible taught that Jesus is already reigning as a king. You know, uh, if He is, then there's no need for him to become what he already is. He is the king. Daniel chapter 7 depicts the ascension of Christ. The He's coming of to the ancient, ancient of days. days, and what does he receive? What is given to him at the time of his arrival in heaven? The Lord doesn't say, or God the Father doesn't say, well, son, you tried to set up that earthly kingdom, but they unexpectedly rejected you, and so... Uh, We'll, you know, stay up here and start the church age, and then after the church age has clicked along for a while, we'll finish the church age with the rapture. And then, after seven years of great tribulation on earth, we'll go back, and that time we'll fight the battle of Armageddon. That's when we'll set up the kingdom on earth. Well, here's a question. 
if Jesus really meant to set up a key, an earthly kingdom the first time, he didn't know it because he said, my kingdom is not of this world, of this world John 18, 36. And if Jesus meant to set up an earthly kingdom the first time and couldn't get it done, because why? Well, he was unexpectedly rejected. What's to keep him from being unexpectedly rejected and, the and, next time he tries? And, and by the way, B.J., that's ludicrous. Because Isaiah chapter 53 depicts the coming of the Messiah. And Isaiah's writing seven centuries before Jesus comes yeah. to earth. Isaiah chapter 53 depicts him as being despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. So it wasn't some shock to God no. that Jesus was rejected. Who, who rejected whom? In John 6... After Jesus fed the multitude, some of them people, some of the people said, "This is of a truth that prophet." They they thought he was the Messiah, and he was in fact the Messiah. But here's what they didn't understand about the Messiah: they tried to take him by force and make him king. What kind of king? They wanted to make him an earthly king. That's right. And what did he do? He slipped away from them. If he came to be an earthly king, here's his chance. That's right. But he didn't come to be an earthly king. That's right. Where, is he king now? What does Peter say in Acts 2.36? Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that same Jesus whom you crucified has been made both Lord and Christos, Christ, the anointed one. He's been anointed because he's now the king. That's right. Okay, so we talk about the kingdom of God and those who are saying that the kingdom is yet to come. And yet I read in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus saying, Verily, verily, Surely, surely, assuredly, I say to you, right. there are some standing here who will not taste death. And then he said, till, T-I-L-L. Right. They see the kingdom of God come with power or present with power. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have a question. If, if the Lord hasn't come and set up his kingdom, then there have got to be some folks walking around out here that are still alive. If he told the truth, then who's going to say, no, the Lord lied? He did tell the truth. He said, some of you listening to me say these very things I'm saying in Mark 9, 1, will be alive. You will not die until you've seen the kingdom come with power. Okay? Well, when would the power come? It would come according to Luke 24, 49 from on high. Mm -hmm. But when, Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And he's talking specifically to the apostles. That's right. Acts 2, 1, here comes the Holy Spirit. Falling upon the apostles, they speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it's no surprise then that later in the same chapter, Peter would reference the promises that had been made to David and say, you know what you heard David receive the promise that one of his descendants would establish a kingdom and That's build right. me a house, Second Samuel 7. He's doing it right now today on this day of Pentecost. Great point. He Great started point. reigning that day. By the way, we, we talk about the promises of God. When, when John the Baptist began his earthly ministry, his message, his message was, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Matthew 4, verse 17. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, same message. Yes. So the question is, were they telling the truth? You know, Mike, it's, it's really blasphemous to suggest, well, they meant well when they said that. They thought that was the case, but they didn't know yet. And as you quoted, how could they not have known they were going to be rejected, that Jesus specifically was going to be rejected? When you have Isaiah 53, that's written six, seven hundred years before Christ ever came. No and way. what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4? The death the burial and the resurrection of Christ was, quote, according to the scriptures. That's it right. wasn't plan B. It wasn't, oh no, we've got an emergency. What are we going to do? Let's call an audible at the line of scrimmage. The defense is ready for the play we called in the huddle. That is not, not the case. No. I tell you what, there's further proof in the Bible that Jesus can't reign on earth. He That's cannot right. reign on earth because Zechariah 6, 12 and 13 says that while he's a priest on his throne, he will be a priest upon his throne. But wait a minute. Hebrews 8, 4 says if he were on earth, he could not be a priest. That's right. But Zechariah 6, 13 already said when he's on his throne, he will be a priest. But if he can't be a priest on earth, therefore his throne can't be where? That's right. It can't be located on earth because Jesus Christ is already on his throne. That's right. He's reigning right now at the right hand of the Father on high. 
and he's our high priest right now. Absolutely, absolutely. BJ, there is ample evidence in Scripture. The kingdom is here. Mm -hmm. In Colossians chapter 1, when the Apostle Paul wrote to those saints, he talked about how they had been delivered out of the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Right. When John wrote in the Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, he talked about how he was a brother, a companion with them in tribulation and in the kingdom. Exactly. So you have ample evidence. When Jesus comes again, he's not coming to set up the kingdom. He's going to do what with the kingdom? 1 Corinthians 15 is emphatic. It says, and then shall the end come when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and following. He delivers it up, not sets it up. It's already been set up. You and I are born again. We're added to what? We are born again to enter the kingdom. John 3, 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into what? The kingdom. But you and I have been born of water and the Spirit, therefore right. we've entered the kingdom. Because the kingdom has a king already, not one in the wings waiting That's for right. his royal apparel. He is right now our King of kings, Lord of lords, First Timothy 6, 14 and 15. Right. He's the potentate. He has all power. That's exactly He's not right. waiting to get it. He has it now. He has it. He rules and reigns at the right hand of the Father. In Acts chapter 2, as you alluded to a moment ago, the Bible talks about Jesus sitting upon the throne of David. It's not a physical, literal throne. It's a spiritual throne. And Jesus reigns today, as is evident throughout the Scriptures, right. as you mentioned a moment ago. Absolutely. BJ, I know we got a minute left. What would a person need to do to become a member of the kingdom of God? Follow the instructions of the king. And the king made it clear. The king said, you need to believe that I am he, that I'm the one I claim to be, the one sent by God the Father. If you don't believe that about me, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. The king says that all men everywhere are commanded to repent, Acts 17, 30. And he's a good king. The goodness of our king ought to lead us to repentance, Romans 2 and verse 4. And the king says through his inspired writers in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that confession is made in the direction of salvation unto salvation as one believes leaves, but uh, that's not enough because we get into, not unto, when we are baptized into Christ. That's right. According to Galatians 3, 26 and 27, that's when we put on Christ. That's when we are uh, cleansed by the blood of Christ, right. Romans 6, 3 and 4. That's when we become a member of the church of Jesus Christ, Acts 2, 47. And we live for Christ until the day we get to see Christ and live with Christ. So true. BJ, thank you again for being with me. As always, thank you for being a part of our program. Look forward to seeing you right back here next week. God bless. Amen. Flashlight. Switch time. Flash selected. Screen recording.